Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana. And we're here today with special guest, Fazana Ali, who's here to share with us her new book, Sound Healing, How to Use Sound to Beat Stress and Anxiety. So did you know that there's science that backs how sound healing can impact your health in a positive way? Well, today, Fazana Ali is going to share with us just that. So Fazana Ali is known as the sound therapist and as a sound practitioner. She also leverages a 17-year career as a former lifestyle and wellness journalist, having worked for both glossy magazines and national newspapers during which she tried out and tested all types of meditation and mindfulness activities and interviewed leading experts across the well-being field. So let's welcome to the show, Fazana Ali. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. What inspired you to write this? Well, I guess the... The popularity of sound um, has meant that a lot of new people are being exposed to it constantly. And I kept finding that when new clients would come to a session or a class, they'd be asking me the same questions. There was an eagerness to know exactly how it's working. There was an eagerness to discuss their experiences and, you know, how they found the sound or how it was moving within them. And so I was getting a lot of the same kind of questions come up. And I thought, you know what, there's there's definitely an area here where I feel like people are seeking answers and hopefully I can provide that for them. Well, I like how you start off the book asking a couple questions. Mm -hmm. And I think one question was really uh, very interesting is what is sound? I think a lot of people think they know that, but Mm -hmm. they may not really have the idea of what that really encompasses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think also sometimes when you're working in this kind of therapeutic space, understanding and having a real understanding of what the modality is and how it can help you kind of reinforces the fact that it is helping you. And I think that's what I kind of hope to do with the book, where it's just delving into the layers of how sound is working with you, how the fact that we are all vibrations and we do respond so well, so intrinsically with this particular modality. I think a lot of times people forget that sound is energy too. Yes, of course. And I think in the last couple of years where we've been talking more about manifestation, about the energy that we give out there, the energy that we surround ourselves with, I think people are you know, really kind of starting to tap into their awareness of energy and how it relates to their day-to-day lives. And I think, you know, in that way, sound is such a, I guess, universal thread that kind of binds all of that together. So is there emotional impact of sound? Absolutely. So one of the things I find that people are sometimes surprised about is how emotive sound is. And, you know, sometimes you're met with a bit of scepticism when you say this to someone experiencing sound healing for the first time. And then you break it down for them and, you you know, you, you ask them, do they put on a favorite track before they go for a run? Do they put on music and it has, you know, kind of moves them in a, in a film scene? So we already do use music in this way and sound in this way to change our emotional state. It's just that we don't call it, we don't recognize it in this therapeutic, um, I guess, therapeutic umbrella as such. And so what we're doing with sound, rather as opposed to music, is that we're deconstructing the music. So you can't get quite caught up with the lyrics or you're not getting swept up by um, a particular melody. So we're deconstructing it. And so the sound is able to take you deeper into your emotional processing, deeper into those shifts that you might want to encourage and and kind of see occur. I know there is a lot of talk around white noise and there's pink noise and brown noise. So when we talk about white noise, what is that and why is it so helpful? 
So white noise is a broad umbrella um, sound, I guess, uh, where it contains all the frequencies that are uh, perceptive to the human ear. And they're all played at a certain, you know, at the same, same, um, same kind of volume. So what it does, it causes, it creates, sorry, it creates like an audio camouflage. So it's really easy for your brain to kind of switch off and not be distracted. It's why we use white noise to help put babies to sleep because then they're not picking up on any other sounds. It kind of allows your brain to, I guess, space out. And that can take you to a place of if you're trying to concentrate or if you're um, trying to find, yeah, you know, focus or you're just cutting out, um, um, you know, kind of environmental noise. It's really good for that. I know I use, um, I believe it's the brown sound sometimes when I'm having a hard time going to sleep. And that That's seems to favorite. help. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? It, I love that you've said that because brown noise is my personal favorite as well. It's a much deeper rumbling sound. Um, the higher, the higher octaves, the of, of you know are kind of quieter, and so it's much more of a rumbling sound. I find it very, very deeply, deeply relaxing. So, do people self medicate with sound? Intrinsically, as human beings, we have been self-medicating with sounds since since we began to walk. You know, we, we do this um, quite naturally, and our bodies re- respond uh, to you know to therapeutic sound. It's just that we don't use it in this modern. We don't kind of recognize it in this modern framework of therapy. So, you know, being by the ocean is relaxing. We all know that. And it's re- it's a universally relaxing experience for every single human. Um, same as if you're walking in the woods and you hear the gentle rustle of the leaves of the trees, it is a universally pleasing sound. And those sounds tell us that we're safe. So what happens is when we're feeling safe in those environments, our um, breath rate slows down, our heart rate slows down, and so we we relax, we activate our, you know, parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so that's where, you know, we do use it to self-soothe. It's just that we don't recognize it in a, you know, that kind of modern context, but it's, it's very, we're very receptive to, to sound as, as human beings. So what is some of the history of sound healing? And it, actually, before we go there, why don't we talk about what sound healing is? So people have an understanding of what that looks like. Yeah. So sound healing, as I describe in the book, it's a modality which uses sound, frequency and vibration to induce a much more relaxed and restful state of being. So we're using sound to activate our parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite of the fight or flight, uh, you know, part of the nervous system that we kind of we're in when we're stressed out or we're very anxious or we're feeling like, you know, quite a lot of overwhelm. So you can you share some of the history of sound healing with us? Because I know you go into that in your book and I found that so mm. fascinating. So as, as mentioned, you know, before with with sound, we we as a species, I guess, you know, resonate so deeply with it that across the globe, all of our ancestors use sound in some kind of therapeutic way. Um, a lot of this has been lost and it's being rediscovered by specialist archaeologists. But one thing I mentioned in the book, for example, is that um, Stonehenge, which is obviously a, a very important monument in England, where I'm from, is that you know scientists in recent years have discovered that the placement of the stones you know, actually create a a speaker system. So if you're singing or playing an instrument at one particular part, then the sound travels. It The way that the, it bounces across the structure, it travels and it would have been used to lull, you know, the recipients of, of any ceremony that was taking place. It would lull them into a trance-like state. There's obviously examples as well of sound healing, you know, chambers in pyramids, 
from you know Egypt to to kind of the ancient Americas. Um, we've got the Aboriginal uh, population of um, of Australia. Um, they, you know, the, the kind of instruments they use have been shown to again induce a very rested, restful, relaxed state uh, where your brain waves slow down and and you kind of can enter that trance state that is so beneficial for the brain. I was really enjoying the fact that you talked about how Malta had the oracle chamber. And mm-hmm. I had never heard of that. And yeah. I thought that was such an interesting piece of history. Well, like I say, it's it's across it's across the globe. It's, you know, we've got these examples of, you know, early humans using um and humans across the millennia actually using sound and using acoustics in in this way. It's just, you know, we've kind of lost some of that um some of that connection to sound, you know, in in that modern world, in the modern world that we're in at the moment. So why do you think that sound and because I I myself I went to a sound bath for New Year's Eve a few years back you know, and Amazing. I enjoyed it. I loved it. But why do you think sound is making this like resurgence that people are really paying attention to it? I think there's a few factors. I think the last couple of you know, the last couple of years we've gone through such a monumental global shift and people are prioritizing their mental well-being in a way that I guess as someone who's been in wellness for for nearly 20 years I haven't seen previously if I'm really honest. Secondly, I think for most of us especially you know I've come from a very corporate world when most of us are you know when we're stressed and we're anxious the idea of having to undertake another thing to add another thing to your to-do list to to kind of embark on learning or you know actively getting yourself out and out of that feeling of stress and anxiety can be quite overwhelming and it's you know another thing to add to the very long to-do list that most of us have i think the beauty with sound healing is that it's a very passive activity it's a very passive modality all you have to do, say if you're coming in for a session, as you will know from your New Year's Eve sound bath, is you enter the space and you lie down. And that's as the extent of your hard work, really. The practitioner is the one who who kind of then takes over. The space is held for you. The way they play and use the instruments, your brain can't help through a process that we call sympathetic resonance, your brain can't help but match up to sync up to these these slower sound waves that then slow down your brain waves. And so I think that's one of the biggest draws, you know, you don't have to kind of, it's it's a very low um, effort activity. And I think in a world that's constantly demanding more from us, it's really nice actually to have someone else hold the space and someone else do the hard work, but we benefit. I was so impressed by your background, by the way. I, <laughs> I, I mean, you come at this at a very unique perspective, a physician, scientist, biomedical engineer, public health researcher. I mean, as we look at these, these, um, you know, titles that, that explain the the work that you do it also goes into this book and you can see how it's all linked together because one of the things that you talk about is the mind body link. Mm. And I found that so fascinating because a lot of times when we hear about sound healing, it doesn't come from a place of science. Yes. um, That is very, very, very correct. And, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes think that I might not like what, you know, we would consider, you know, I don't know if you use this term necessarily across the pond, but, you know, things can be explained in a very woo or woo woo kind of way. Looking at things is actually just oftentimes just science that hasn't been explained. Now, with my background, I know that for a lot of the clients that I see, the science is actually very important and they want it explained in in a way that they'll, you know, if someone is kind of coming at them and saying, oh, I'm not sure I believe this, they can be like, actually, here are the studies, here's what the doctor is saying, here's what, um, 
the research that's been conducted is saying. And I think that was really important for me as a practitioner when I was studying even to really understand how our brain is working, our ear works, how our body works, how our nervous system is connected, what the vagus nerve is doing and how all of, you know, it all kind of um, interacts with each other. And I think that's what I've tried to kind of make sure I have that message within the book. Um, and hopefully that comes across in an accessible way where it's not too complicated. But yeah, I think for me personally, it was really important to make sure there was a strong scientific foundation to everything I was talking about. But like I say, you know, it doesn't mean that I don't believe in more um, uh, naturalistic or holistic kind of ways of, you know, explaining things and and oftentimes, you know, things that we don't yet have the understanding for, we can kind of almost say that it's all very alternative. But, you know, sometimes science just needs to catch up. I would agree with that. It's interesting what they do call woo-woo, you know, or just woo kind mm. of information has now become very mainstream. We talk about mindfulness yes. and all the research done behind that Absolutely. and meditation so why not sound healing too? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if if you do have someone, you know, strapped up to a monitor, you can, you know, measure their heart rate. You can measure, you know, their brain waves. So we know that it works. And I guess sometimes when, you know, like I said, this is such an ancient practice really at its essence, we sometimes forget what our ancestors did and how they kind of coped and had, you know, enhanced their well-being. And then, you know, we can bec become dismissive of it the more kind of technologically advanced we get. And now it's, I feel like it's almost like a reclaiming. It's, you know, going back to that innate knowledge that we had and understanding, oh, yeah, I do see how that works, actually. And, yes, when I do go on holiday and I'm on a, by a beach, I do feel calm and not just because I'm on holiday, but because the sound of the, you know, the ocean lapping at the shore is actually shown to be scientifically pleasant for us, scientifically relaxing. You know, recent studies have shown that um, listening to birdsong, you know, we can actively measure how restful that is for us. And so, you know, maybe, yeah, 10, 15 you know, even 30, 40 years ago, if you'd said something like that, people would think you're part of a hippie community, that you're just out in the woods listening to the birds. But actually, science is showing that those things are are indeed true. Thank goodness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah in your book, you, you there's a, a quote here, it says, to change the way you're thinking, you have to change the way you're feeling. You can't just talk or think your way out of stress and trauma. Why is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. So part of, you know, sometimes Western um, psychotherapy, Western therapy in general, we can have a habit of over-intellectualizing everything and over-discussing and over kind of um, creating an intellectual kind of argument for something. And what happens is sometimes we need to feel our way through what it is that we need to process. And that's where the change happens because, you know, someone could tell you that, you know, you, you're not stressed. And you could tell yourself that, oh, yeah, no, okay, fine, I'm not stressed. But we need the evidence to kind of back this up. And if your body, if your heart rate is elevated, if your, you know, your breath is shallow, your brain is not going to listen to the words that you're physically saying because your body is giving it all these cues and all this information to say, nah, -uh, this is wrong. You are actually in danger. So we do have to feel it. We do have to have a much more, you know, I say in the book, a much more bottom up approach where we kind of address the physical, we address the body before we really address the mind you know, sometimes over kind of analyzing something can actually disconnect us from the emotion that we're, you know, that we actually just need to feel. You know, I would also probably add 
and you know, and not everyone may agree with this, but I would also add that sometimes if we we can, you know, we can villainize emotions or certain feelings and we can think things like anger are bad and that we should never feel angry. But that's that's actually not true at all. Anger is a very important messenger. You know, feelings of anxiety, they are messengers. They they are telling us that something needs to change. They are warning signs. They are signals to say something is out of balance in your life and you need to look at this before before I make you sick physically, you know, and I think that's something that we really should give more importance to. Well, on that note, we're going to pause here for a quick break. We've been speaking with Fazana Ali in regards to her new book, Sound Healing, How to Use Sound to Beat Stress and Anxiety. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Lindsay Roy's new book, The Gift of Perspective, is a must-read. Lindsay's unique life stories of surviving and thriving after two major life challenges is a wonderful companion to start your new year. It's a great guidebook for anyone facing a challenge, big or small, in business or in life. Lindsay's own stories and the anecdotes of those she met along the way help illuminate real ideas in real circumstances, drawing out reflections and actionable takeaways for all. Full of faith, grit, and humor, this book has the power to change how you see things. The Gift of Perspective is available at Amazon or visit Lindsay's website at lindsayroy.com. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. We're here today with special guest, Fazana Ali, in regards to her new book, Sound Healing, How to Use Sound to Beat Stress and Anxiety. So when we talk about healing our mind, what does that look like? What does that entail? So healing the mind um, can be addressed and looked at in very, you know, in several different ways. You know, the the way we talk to ourselves, the information that we give ourselves, the you know, the timings that we take in information. You, you know, I love having you know a cell phone, a mobile phone, but how many of us are guilty? of waking up and, you know, taking quite hefty news first thing in the morning. And so looking at that is just kind of um, understanding that the way we process information, the information that we, uh, you know, absorb, to to do it in a much more mindful way, to to allow yourself time to um, process things Earlier, we talked about a sound bath, and I'd love for you to explain for our listeners who haven't experienced that what a sound bath is. Yeah, so a sound bath is the name that we give a session that involves any type of sound healing or sound therapy. And, you know, sound healing is obviously what I mentioned before. It's the modality where we're using sound and frequency vibrations to to take that nervous system into a place of calm. So a sound bath typically, you know, involves you coming into um, into a space where you lie down, you get comfortable. You can be either lying on yoga mats or cushions on the floor, or you can be in a in a one to one setting. You can be on a therapy bed, and that's kind of your active participation. That's you know that's that's where that ends. We usually with clients, you know, you kind of tuck people. I tuck people in 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 into blankets, make sure they're very very comfortable, and then the practitioner will play whatever instrument that they have access to or they're doing that day, and they're using that to create the you know 
and these are therapeutic grade instruments I should add they're using that to kind of um, take you on this sonic journey of deep rest and usually when we talk about sound baths why is that a a thing that someone would consider doing so I see with clients coming in for a you know I see clients coming in for with a you know for a variety of reasons for most people it's because they've been feeling a bit run down a bit stressed out they're feeling quite a lot of overwhelm at work or in their personal life and so they're looking for a bit more of a you know a a sanctuary where they can switch off and rest you know I don't know about you but for for a lot of us sometimes relaxing at home can be difficult you know I know personally you know before I became a sound therapist and, and started on this journey I found it really hard to meditate when I'm at home and I'm, you know, I'd I'd try and meditate. I'd be thinking, well, I'll just, I'll just put the laundry in because then at least I'll be meditating and productive or I'll just go and pop, you know, pop, you know, the dishwasher on. Uh, You know, there's all, all these things and intrusive thoughts. Whereas when you go to a space, it's easier for you to switch off and you know that you're there solely for that reason. But, you know, that said, I have clients who, have, you know, who have come in because they're going through really big changes in their life. So they've, they're either leaving a job or starting a new job, a relationship has ended, you know, they've had some kind of grief or bereavement, um, or they're going through, you know, I, I see clients who are going through chemotherapy, and they're looking for a space where they can just unwind and and help remove some of that emotional baggage that they might be carrying you know from whatever experience they're going through I also have clients who you know these these people are easier to spot when their partner's very much into this and they've kind of been you know and I wouldn't say it's unfair even to say they've been kind of dragged along to to experience it and then once they're there their 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 eyes are open to this and they're so shocked and and moved by their experience that then they come back and they bring other friends with them. So you know it can be it can be for a whole host of reasons. Sometimes people just come in because they want to switch off and they like the feeling that you get after a sound bath, which is you know you feel mentally refreshed, you feel rested. It's it's a really lovely and again a really beautiful passive way to just leave your thoughts at the door and have some time for yourself. So what if someone falls asleep? Do they still get the benefits of a sound bath? Yes, they do. They do. Honestly, if I could tell you the number of times people will apologize for falling asleep or they'll be worried if they've been snoring or whatnot. But um, when you're in in in-person session, you're not just, you know, hearing the vibrations, you're not just hearing the sound, but those vibrations are going through you as well. So you are definitely receiving the benefits in a much more um, somatic, physical way. Of course, you might be missing out on the um, introspective um, changes that happen or the the creativity sometimes that people experience after a sound bath. So you might not be feeling that. But as I you know, mentioned in the book, sleep is paramount to good health. It is absolutely paramount. And so if in that moment, your body, your physical need of sleep is um, the most overriding need that you have, then that's okay. Fall asleep. I, I really don't mind if people fall asleep in a session because you can't be mentally refreshed and you can't be emotionally healthy unless you're adequately physically rested and and that comes from sleep so it's okay to feel, fall asleep don't feel guilty for it and yes in a in a, in a real life situation where you're present um having the sound bath and you know not just a digital recording or something then you are feeling those vibrations they're going through you on a cellular level so how do we heal through sound how how does that work so there's many, many um, different kind of ways, um, as I mentioned, the emotional processing that can happen when your brain is in a theta dominant state. So 
you know, processing our emotions, filing things away. Um, that happens. Feeling uh, mentally refreshed. This happens because when, again, when we're in that deeply uh, relaxed state, when we're in a theta dominant brainwave state, the mineral levels in our brain reset. They leak, you know, they recalibrate. So again, that that's a you know very physical, tangible benefit that's happening to you. Um, in terms of um, you know slowing down your your you know breath rate and your heart rate, your your body's got time to to kind of unwind, to relax. Again, another very physical kind of tangible thing. In terms of um, again going back to that kind of mo- mental and emotional processing, when we are rested, and I mean truly rested. It is easier for us to view our lives and view our situations with more clarity. So clarity is, I believe, something that we don't talk about enough when it comes to sound healing. And clarity is, is it gives us the answers. So, you know, sometimes when we're rested, we can actually see our way out of a situation that can be causing the anxiety or the stress that we don't want in our lives, which is very easy to miss the mist of frustration or anger or desperation is clouding our view. So that's, you know, that's definitely a a big draw. How does sound healing impact our brain and our brain activity? So at the moment, for example, we're speaking, we're concentrating, you're thinking about your questions, I'm thinking about my answers. We're engaged in um, a beta dominant brainwave state. So that's, you know, the day to day when we're thinking, when we're doing too much time spent in a beta dominant brainwave state is what causes us to feel stressed and anxious. When we are in slower, when our brainwaves slow down and we're in slower dominant brainwave states, that's when we feel relaxed. That's when we process things. So alpha state, an alpha dominant state is when we are awake and alert but it's it's kind of um we're not concentrating so it's like when if you're taking a bath for example you know you're awake and and you you're you have enough um awareness not to kind of like slip into the bath water or anything like that so you are awake and you're aware but you're kind of almost on autopilot you're you're your brain is kind of semi switched off, you could say. From there, we have another brainwave state called theta. So theta is the one I was just speaking about. And theta dominance is when we we experience this naturally when we're in REM sleep, uh, you know, rapid eye movement sleep. That's when dreams happen, when we're in that trance state. We're not in deep sleep, but we're we're definitely not awake. And we're not concentrating, we're not doing anything. And that's the time when the brain processes, experiences, um, emotions, and allows our brain to kind of um, reset the mineral levels. So that's that's a really good way, good state to be in. Our brains naturally through through a day should have, should go through ups and downs in these, you know, different brain waves. We should we, we shouldn't be spending too ma- too much time in one in ba- in a beta dominant state. However, the life that we the lifestyles that we have currently and the life that you know most of us lead is that we're constantly switched on. We are always concentrating. Years ago, if you were going from meeting to meeting, you might you know, and you were in I don't know on a bus or you know for us in in London you know on a tube on the underground you you might kind of you know be allow your thoughts to wander you might read a poster you might you know if you're on the bus you might look out the window when we do those things our brain waves slow down we kind of you know allow ourselves to have a you know the brain to engage in a more restful state but we don't have that anymore how many of us you know, when we're going from a meeting to another meeting, we're checking emails, we're applying back to text, we're wondering, you know, what we're having for dinner, we're ordering things, we're, you know, doing errands. So we're constantly in this 
heightened state of being switched on all the time. And that's where a lot of this stress and anxiety kind of manifests because we don't give ourselves adequate time to rest. What the um, the instruments that we use in sound healing do is that because the sound waves that are produced from these instruments are slower, they slow down your brain waves. And the process is called entrainment or sympathetic resonance. So it's when, you know, um, something kind of syncs up to something else. And that's essentially what's happening to your brain. Your brain is syncing up to the slower brain waves that are, um, sorry, the slower waves that are being produced by the instruments. So the slower sound waves slow down your brain waves. And that's where we kind of, you know, slip into those slower, more relaxed brainwave states. So when we are experiencing sound healing, does that make us more resilient? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things I speak about again in in the book is that the idea that resilience means that you're just supposed to... um, you know, that resilience means being the ability to put up with an incredible amount of hurt or trauma or, or anguish, you know, and that's not really true. Resilience is how quickly we can bounce back from something. And sound healing is a really excellent way to help increase our resonance, uh, resistance. And it does this by changing how we view things. And what I mean by that is that sound healing is a great tool to increase our resonance, how positively we see the world. And this happens because the more time we spend in deep rest, the more clarity we have over our lives, the more positive things start to appear. If you've got a, you know, if you've got a, let's take a very broad example, if you've got a problem with a colleague at work, for example, and you come to sound baths or you do any type of really deep meditation work where you allow yourself time to really think about how you can address something or move through something, the answers are more likely to come when you're rested. So it gives you tools to then deal with the situation that may be causing you the stress or anxiety, such as, you know, speaking to that colleague or working out a way to speak to that colleague. So it gives you resolution, but you're able to see things in a much clearer way. You can understand that actually this colleague, maybe they're not being difficult because they hate me, but actually maybe they're going through something and they're projecting. And so whatever situation you might be having at work actually has nothing to do with you or your ability. Does does that make sense? So it kind of helps you reframe things. And when you're reframing things, you can, you know, see things in a much more positive light. The more positive we are about our, our, you know, lives, the more positive our thoughts are, the more positive our emotions are, the more positive our outlook on life is. And that is a great tool to help us build our resilience. I really like how in your book, you talk about how when you do sound baths with your clients you have them embrace their thoughts that arise. And I thought that that was so powerful because a lot of times I think we've been trained to go, okay, those are bad thoughts. I'm going to have to stuff those away somewhere. Yeah. So my belief is there are no bad thoughts. There are, you know, every thought that you have, everything that comes up is, again, it's vital information. It's giving you, it's giving you, um, it's coming up for a reason. So when a thought comes up in a sound bath, and it can be, and I say this to clients all the time, it can be something that may seem really insignificant. And you might be lying there thinking, I'm supposed to be relaxing. Why am I thinking about, you know, um, did I defrost the chicken before I left this morning? You know, it, it can it can be something really, you know, has, has no um, real kind of importance. But If you get stuck in a battle of trying to control your thoughts, you're putting yourself back into a very engaged thinking um, brainwave state. Whereas if you allow your thoughts to come and go and allow whatever is coming into your head, 
no, ma- no matter how insignificant it may seem initially, that thought could lead you to other thoughts, which lead you to, you know, another thought, which could actually be very crucial in, in you helping you understand what it is that's the source of any anxiety or the thoughts of any kind of underlying stress that, you know, you're experiencing. And so, yeah, absolutely go with your thoughts, allow them to come from there, you know, you kind of, you're in a flow state. And when we're in a flow state, it's easier for us to allow our brains to switch off. So when we're thinking about all these things, is that our ego trying to take over? No, no, absolutely not. I don't think of it in that way at all. It can be, like I say, if if you're, you know, whatever thoughts come up, they're, they're messengers. So if if you're, you know, if you're if you're lying there in a sound bath and you're thinking about an earlier interaction, and say it's someone in the coffee shop and they've pushed past you and that's made you really angry, and you're, you know, you're thinking about that. And you're thinking, I should have said something or I should have been more, you know, you know, stood my ground a bit more or that may seem like on the surface may seem like a very insignificant thing. But if you're feeling really angry about it in a session or it's it's kind of consuming your session, then it could be that you have something that, you know, a, a deeper need that you need to process about your boundaries. That actually, from there, you know, you you could be like, oh, it reminds me of the time that my, you know, my friend suggested this and I just kind of went along with it and I've swept along and actually I should have stood my ground more. And so it could be, that could be your real, that could be the real issue, the underlying issue that's actually made you very cross in the first place. So thinking about the coffee shop interaction, for example, in that moment may seem like, oh, oh God, it's a waste of time. I should be Zen. I should be thinking about flowers and trees and, and not this, you know, this person who pushed past me and made me very, very angry. But actually, you know, like I say, if you go with your thoughts, you may then uncover a link and it may help you resolve something else that you're actually trying to address, which could be, for instance, a, a, a you know, a perceived lack of your personal boundaries. Now, if you if you allow your thoughts to go and say, for example, this is, you know, the core of your issue that's making you angry. That's when, you know, when I was talking about the clarity, that's the clarity. And then when you can deal with that underlying issue, you'll find moving forward, this is when an increase of resonance happens. You'll find moving forward that if that situation happens again, where someone pushes past you or is aggressive in a coffee shop, it will just not bother you. It ju- it just won't bother you. It will not matter. It will not bother you because you'll be able to understand that that interaction actually doesn't have anything to do with you. And you can be like, okay, if you're that if you're that desperate for your coffee, please come in front of me. So again, it's just allowing you, yourself to go with your thoughts in the same way that emotions are not negative. You know, they are important messengers. It sounds like it offers us the ability to have more compassion and understanding for other people. Absolutely. But, you know, I think it's important to remember that compassion and understanding first has to begin with yourself. And so if you, you know, through these type of activities, through these type of modalities, through this, you know, undertaking of deep rest, have more compassion for yourself, understand yourself better it will, of course, then help you understand those around you better as well. So can sound healing help us process grief and loss? Absolutely, it can. Absolutely. You know, I think um, it's important to understand firstly that, you know, grief is supposed to be felt. You know, that's not, um, it's not something that we should, you know, brush under the rug it's not something that we should shy away from you know grief is you know there's this that you know that beautiful kind of quote where you know grief is all that unexpressed love that you still have and it's okay to feel grief 
it's okay to be sad. We are supposed to be sad. If some, if, you know, if we experience a bereavement in whichever way that is, you know, it could be the loss of a relationship, the loss of a home, the loss of, you know, a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, whatever it is, we're meant to experience those things. We're meant to process, you know, we're meant to feel our way through it to process it. And, you know, sound is a beautiful container for that. I think a lot of the issues we have in modern society, I mean, as you know, as especially here maybe in, in England is that stiff upper lip where it's just, you know, you've got to just got to keep going. But actually that's a very unhealthy way to be. And, you know, sound just gives you a really beautiful container to allow you to feel how you're feeling. And it's okay to, un, you know, it, it gives you the opportunity to understand that it's okay to feel feel terrible at times. If you're going through a bereavement and you feel desperately sad, it's because you're meant to feel desperately sad. And that's not a bad thing. What are some of the other benefits? I know we've talked about quite a few, but what are some of the other benefits of sound healing? So one thing I think never gets spoken about, because like you say, we've we've addressed some of the big ones here already, but, you know, it's community and building community and allowing yourself, um, you know, when you go to these type of healing, healing places and healing practices, it introduces you to like-minded people. And it introduces you to people who are on a path of healing or who are on a path of more compassion, more understanding. And it's a really great place to meet new people and, and, and you know, widen your circle to include more people who have that type of awareness. What would you like readers and our listeners to take away from your book? Um, I guess my main takeaway is that it is okay to rest that you have permission to rest you have permission to live a life you know that is going at the pace that is comfortable for you that it's okay to slow down when you need to slow down it's okay to not want to be going at a crazy fast insane speed um if you don't want to do that and if and actually it's not sustainable so it's removing, you know, the guilt of trying to have it all and trying to do too much. Um, and, and rest is something that we all desperately need and we benefit from so much. And I guess that you've got permission. You have permission to rest. I say this in every single class. So I guess maybe that's the biggest takeaway that you have the permission to, to slow down. Where can our listeners learn more about the work that you do and be part of your community? So um, if they're on social media, then, um, you know, connecting with me there, I, you know, um, share uh, sound clips on there quite a lot. I share any research that's coming out. And, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, sharing just fun community things that, that we're all doing. So, um, yeah, if they're on um if they're on kind of, you know, Instagram, then the sound therapist is my handle. Um, they can reach out to me um, through messages there. I mean, I would love to hear from, from people about how sound has impacted their lives for sure. And do you have a website? Yes, I have a website. It's um, the soundtherapist.com. So again, they can reach out that way as well. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. No, thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it's such a, such a, such a pleasure and such an honor. And I hope that this message um, and this chat resonates with, uh, with your listeners. Well, thank you, Frazana. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Sound Healing, How to Use Sound to Beat Stress and Anxiety. Sound Healing's available to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere books are sold. And you can also purchase this book directly from the publisher at Watkins Publishing. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. Thank you.
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary. A recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.